right, so we're doing pupils today. So first let's talk about the approach to anisocoria. And uh, this is pretty basic. There's a really good uh, focus article that just gives you this nice algorithm that you can use. And I refer to it every once in a while. The first thing I like to do if I see someone or I'm getting consulted for someone who has uh, unequal pupils is I want to measure their pupil sizes in bright light and dark light. And that's the first part of my algorithm. It tells me if this is more of a sympathetic problem versus more of a parasympathetic problem. So if the difference is more pronounced in the dark, then I'm wondering about there's a sympathetic problem, specifically a Horner syndrome. And I can go down this, this list over here. So is there some ptosis? Maybe they have some anhydrosis if it's a third order Horner's. Uh, you can confirm with a number of testing. Of note, this is kind of old. We don't actually have any hydroxyamphetamine anywhere. So you can't really do that anymore. But um, you can also look for dilation lag when you see the patient, and that's something you'll see in Horner syndrome. And you can find, um, I won't go into it because some of these videos are a little long, but on the novel website, Dr. Degree has a whole bunch of uh, really good videos and movies and pictures of, uh, of things like dilation lag, so you can kind of see what it's supposed to look like. We use cocaine to confirm a Horner syndrome. You can also use apriclonidine. Advantages and disadvantages, so the cocaine is uh, better for a more acute case, but it's harder to get up from pharmacy. We have a bottle of apriclonidine in clinic. The problem with apriclonidine is if it's acute, you do need to have some uh, denervation supersensitivity occurring for it to work, and so uh, you might not pick it up acutely. The other thing is it's a CNS depressant, so we try not to use it in uh, pediatric patients. And then the hydroxyamphetamine is really helpful for determining if it's pre versus post ganglionic. So if it's a third order Horner's, uh, it shouldn't have an effect on that pupil, but if it's prior to that second or first order, it should. But again, we don't really have any hydroxyamphetamine anymore. The other thing that might be going on is it could be a physiologic anisocoria, and that's something to always keep in your differential. And, um, and then the, one other thing that you might see is a little old little old 80 syndrome, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then also just getting a look under the, um, under the slit lamp to see if there's some other reason for that pupil to be a little smaller. And so then what if it's more pronounced in light? Well, then I'm leaning towards parasympathetic dysfunction, and I might be thinking more about a third nerve palsy. Um, but I also really want to look at the overall iris structure, too, because I have to have 80s pupil on there as well. So I look for the segmental paralysis of the iris sphincter. Look at their extraocular movements, look for ptosis, things like that, to lean you more towards a uh, third nerve palsy. So the concern with an isolated um, uh, anisocoria that's uh, more pronounced in bright light is that it could be an, an early third from a compressive lesion. The parasympathetic fibers are on the outside of the nerve, and so as it's starting to be compressed, it's going to start um, hitting those before it starts affecting extraocular movements. And then with these patients, you can use uh, pilocarpine. You can use a very dilute pilocarpine to confirm 80s pupil, and you can use a more um, uh, a heavier dose, like 1%, to see if it's more of a third nerve palsy versus traumatic medriasis. Okay, so let's get right into the cases. So this first case, um, this is in my neurology residency. We got called to see a 72-year-old man. He was in a rollover accident, really bad one. Trauma has seen him. They checked him out. They said, okay, he's stable. He's got like a CT of the neck and some x-rays. We're just going to go review these, but otherwise he's stable. Uh, one thing we notice is that he has a right-blown pupil. Can you come down and take a look at him? Uh, he's also, he's weak on the left, but we think he has some fractures on that side. And um, so we go down, and your brief optho exam is that he's 20-20, and pupils will take a look at that, but there's no APD. Extraocular movements, visual fields are all full, and the fundus looks fine. But he is weak on the left and on the left upper and lower extremities, but he also has an upgoing toe on the left. So this is what he looks like. And what you're thinking, this is one of the first things you look at as an optho resident or his feet, right? <laughs> so um, this is why they're talking about, yeah, we think he fractured his hip, just because hip fractures will frequently cause this external rotation of the leg. But he's got an upgoing toe, so that should point you more towards a central nervous system issue. 
What do you guys notice over here? Exactly. So this should point you towards some kind of autonomic issue on one side, specifically on the left side. It should be ipsilateral. And then what do you guys think of as right blown pupil? Blown pupil. Yeah. <laughs> You're all looking at me like, wait, are you checking? So yeah, so this is not uncommon. I've gotten this consult a couple times where the concern is, look at this really big pupil on the right, but it's no, look at this really small pupil on the left with the ptosis. So what are you guys thinking here? First order Horners, I heard, very good. Because he's got some CNS involvement, this should put you towards the first order. So someone comes in, I love how they always, like, you're the only person in the ED, so they give you this EKG. <laughs> and you just always act like you're like, oh yes, ah, ah, excellent, yes. And all you're doing is you're just reading this up here. And you read that he's got sinus bradycardia. Nothing else going on, so you say, sounds good, thank you very much, and you hand it back to them. All right, and then uh, you just decide to poke through his imaging because you were told uh, so far everything looks negative, but they're reviewing it with radiology. What do you guys think? Yeah, I was going to put some arrows on this <laughs> so you guys could see it a little more easily. But this was an interesting case for me for a number of reasons. Um, and I'll just kind of show this. So we had this bad fracture at about C7. He has this, uh, this is a sagittal MRI. T2 weighted image of the C-spine, and he has this hyperintensity down here. And then this is an axial view, and it's not super easy to see, but you can, you can kind of make out this hyperintensity in one half of the spinal cord. Anyone know the double name eponym for this syndrome? Brown Sicard. Okay, and as you guys, as someone pointed out earlier, it's a first order Horner syndrome, right? Because your sympathetics run from the hypothalamus all the way down to like upper thoracic, and that's where you get your first synapse. So this is the first order. So first order Horners, you should see some CNS involvement. And it comes out there, goes to the stellate ganglion, goes around the subclavian artery, over the apex of the lung. So you could have a pseudoaneurysm in an IV drug user. You could have a pancos tumor. Right, and then it goes up here to the superior cervical ganglion. Synapses, now your third order. This third order, it's important, goes up the carotid artery. And if it hits it at the common carotid artery and there's a dissection causing the horners, then you can have anhydrosis. <coughs> so we won't go through this in detail, but it's good to have a differential for your Horner syndrome. We don't care about Horner syndrome because it, the Horner syndrome itself is hurting the patient but because it indicates that there's something more sinister going on. So in the case of a first order, you're thinking about a stroke as one of your major concerns. Uh, although in this guy's case, he had a brown saccard and it was traumatic. With a second order, you might think about a pancos tumor, although they're incredibly rare. If you see kind of a slow smoldering Horner syndrome and it's like less than three years duration and that's one thing that hasn't been done, you might want to get some chest imaging. And then third order, a major concern is a carotid dissection. Which, can, um, which you do want to deal with urgently. So sometimes a right blown pupil is a left Horner's syndrome. Check your pupils in light and dark. And with this guy, I remember we had this whole team of neurologists. We had two medical students, we had the stroke fellow, and we had the junior resident, and then we had myself. And while everyone was like carefully mapping out this guy's sensation, to a brown saccard, I was looking around for the light switch in the trauma bay. Have you guys ever yeah. looked for the light switch there? So you, you really want to look at, at uh, anisocoria and bright light and dark light, right? And, and sometimes it's a little hard in that trauma bay, but you got to do it. The other thing we did with this guy, I didn't mention, his jeans were hanging over a chair next to his bed. So with his permission, we took out his wallet, looked at his driver's license, just looked to see, is this something he had before his trauma? Because if so, then we're not gonna, that's not gonna play a role in our localization. And then the other thing is just look over the imaging yourself. You could be like, well, I don't know how to read spinal images, but you guys all read that one just fine. So you remember the other people that are going through there are rushed, they're slammed, they're seeing a ton of other patients. I know you guys are too, but if you can just open up the imaging real quick, just make sure it is what it is. Uh, you'll be surprised at how often, especially overnight, a really busy, um, Rad's resident will miss something pretty obvious because they're just not looking for it. 
Okay, the casual blown people is one of my favorites. All right, so I get called about this 34-year-old guy. He's referred for a right blown pupil. So it happened, uh, this, is like, this is like Wednesday, and this happened uh, middle of the day on Saturday. He notices that he has some blurry vision when he's trying to read his bills, middle of Saturday, right? And he goes and looks in the mirror, and he says his pupil is super dilated. So um, I show him some pictures, Google image pictures, and he says it was like that. It was just blown open. And it was just that right pupil. So he walked into the emergency department, and he got an MRA head and neck, MRI brain. Everything was normal. And they referred him to neuro-optho non-urgently, but he was just terrified. Someone had told him, oh, this could mean you're an you have an aneurysm, and uh, MRAs aren't really great for detecting aneurysms. It might have been missed. And so he's just really terrified. He's calling Ann to show him at the front desk, and he's just you know, like begging for a you know, for an appointment. So we just bring him in and see him real quick. We're four days out. The pupil is getting a bit smaller, but it's still slightly larger on the left. His exam is otherwise normal, except for that pupil. So, not super easy to see with his dark iris. Um, so, I put this in here just to help you out. Because in real life, you'd lean in there really close and you'd get a closer look at it. So, um, RLF, anyone know what that stands for? See it on that imaging all the time when we do pupil photos. Room light far. Right, so important when you're measuring pupils to make sure they're looking in the distance so that you don't get some accommodative change to the pupils. And then D15 is in dim lighting for 15 seconds. So we've got our bright and our dark. It's the first part of our algorithm. What do you guys think? Diagnosis, or what do you think compared between the two? Which one is more pronounced? Which one's abnormal? So the right one's abnormal, and the difference between the two, is it more pronounced in dim lighting or bright lighting? Bright, bright lighting, right? So are you leaning towards problems with his sympathetic or his parasympathetic? Parasympathetic. Okay, so the thought here is, is maybe a, a third nerve palsy, right? But an isolated pupil, right? No ptosis. I told you his extraocular movements were all fine. And this is what we got. So I start talking to this guy about, um, what about some eye drops? I mean, look at this pupil that he had before. You don't get that without like putting something in the eye, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm asking him about eye drops. He's like, no, 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 they asked me about that. I didn't put anything in my eye, nothing. So I'm like, oh, crap. I thought that'd be easy. Um, well, what else? What were you doing Saturday when this happened? He's like, I was just out in the yard pulling some weeds. Oh, what weeds? Ah, these really annoying ones. They're pretty looking, but they're all over my yard. And I do a Google image search. I show him this exact picture, and he's like, that's the one. That weed's all over my yard. It's everywhere. I was like, oh, okay. So this is a hot day in August, and... Uh, you're kind of wiping your brow like this, maybe wiping the sweat off after you pull some weeds there. And he's like, yeah, yeah, in fact, I, I think I did that. So, okay, well, case solved. So Jimson weed um, is this uh, weed that you can find around here in Utah. And um, sometimes they describe it as uh, getting in the eyes of farmers too, if it gets caught under their tractor and they're kind of working under it, um, or any kind of vehicle they take out in the field. And it has uh, atropine in it, and so it can cause this kind of toxic or pharmacologic medriasis. We won't go into this, but just a nice list for you to kind of look through uh, when you're wondering about uh, um, possible pharmacologic medriasis. So history, history, history is so important. This guy did not need an MRI brain. He did not need an MRA head and neck. He just needed someone to kind of think about what could possibly have gotten in his eye and how. Uh, know a patient's med list, too. Go through that med list very carefully. And uh, there's some things they won't think to tell you about. And so, um, and I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, another important point here is blown pupils from herniation, they don't walk into the ED, right? So if this person's sitting there having a conversation with you, they're not herniating. So you can, you know, everyone else is going to be just going crazy. And, and sometimes you'll get a call from the ED and they're saying, no, drop, drop your 
drop your open globe, come here and see this patient right away. This person's dying, they're herniating. But every, everyone can just calm down, take a rest, sit down, take a little time to talk to the patient. Another thing though is there's um, some stuff that can become really important like uh, uh, asking them about travel. And so I had a case where uh, someone had this um, pharmacologic medriasis and I was uh, I wasn't really sure what was going on. Nothing on their med list really made sense. They did talk about they had some recent travel to Mexico. Is that a big deal? And I thought, ah, probably not. But as they said that, they did this with their head. And I saw this little patch behind their ear. And I was like, well, I traveled to Mexico. Is that a scopolamine patch? They're like, yeah, yeah. I didn't tell you about that because I, it's not like one of my regular meds. I just take it when I travel. It's like, oh, okay, great. And so the anisocoria was on the same side that they had their little patch there. Um, and then the other thing is you can sometimes get this consult from ICUs. And so it's important to take a look at their mask and take a look at what medications are being blown in through the mask. And sometimes that isn't documented uh, as, as easily either. But uh, something to look for. Question? Yes? This component patch, is that from like self-inoculation or is it, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Werner brought this up one time when she was in med school. Um, this guy took this student up in the front, this really fidgety student, and put this material on his hands. And then uh, at the end of the lecture, uh, he said, so how often were you guys touching your face and your eyes today? He was like an infectious disease professor. And they're like, well, hardly at all. And then he turned on a black light and this guy had like, his fingerprints all over his eyes and his mouth and everything like that. So someone might tell you, oh yeah, I put it here, but I didn't touch my eyes. It's like, yeah, bull crap. Mm -hmm. We all touch our eyes. All right, transient anisocoria. So this is a clinic case we had, 36 year old lady, and she's referred for this transient anisocoria. She has two episodes in which her left eye becomes dilated for about 24 hours before resolving. She's just had two of these. One of them was like years ago. She doesn't remember the exact circumstances. Maybe someone gave her a scopolamine patch for some uh, nausea, but this most recent event, she's watching everything like a hawk. She didn't have anything like that. Nothing in the eye. She, she swears there's nothing in the eye. No headache, no double vision, nothing else going along with this. She has a history of migraine, but she was not having one when this happened. So again, totally normal exam except for the pupils. And these are some photos she gave me they're not terrific, but you can see some things here. This is at the onset. She just takes a picture of herself real quick. And, um, and then this is 10 hours later, and you can see from this bag back here that she's sitting in an emergency department somewhere getting evaluated. So what do you guys think? Which one's the abnormal people? Hard to tell. Yeah. And part of this is the history. She just tells you my left one was just kind of blown open and, and not very reactive. When it's happened to her in the past, it was also the left eye. So any thoughts on this one? Transient anisocoria. In a 30-some-year-old woman, otherwise healthy, normal exam otherwise. By the time she comes in and sees you, it's gone. Her pupils are totally normal. You look at it under the slit lamp, there's no sectoral palsy, vermiform movements, anything. Or Luke's fine. Sorry? One of the differentials like benign episodic medriasis. Okay, good. So that's the differential. Perfect. So um, they also call it springing pupil. And um, it's more common in women than in men. The median age is about 31. They usually last about 12 hours. They're, you know, give or take. And then uh, sometimes they'll have a visual blur when it happens, headache, orbital pain. Sometimes they don't have anything associated with it. But the important thing is that it goes away. And, uh, and you can't find anything in a very careful, thorough history of, of any kind of pharmacologic dilation. So remember, again, to check the person's meds, toxic exposures. Another thing that can cause uh, transient anisocoria is cluster headaches. So asking about that. Um, and then there's this thing called tadpole pupils, another picture from novel that's kind of neat. It's this sectoral pupillary dilation that can last for a few minutes at a time. So people will get it for a few minutes, goes away, comes back a few minutes, goes away, comes back a few minutes, goes away. Maybe it goes on for like a week, a couple times in a week, then it goes away and they never have it again. Um, it's thought to be a benign condition. 
Uh, but there are other things. Um, there's something called uh, midbrain corectopia, where people can have uh, just like an off-center pupil because of midbrain pathology. So a um, couple things to keep in mind there with a transient anisocoria. But most of them not really sinister, not pointing towards like a sinister diagnosis. So you can usually kind of take it down a notch and, and relax with these patients. There's another kind of interesting one, and this was a case of, hor of uh, kind of a reverse Horners that Dr. Katz was telling me about um, called Porfor du Petit. I just thought this was kind of interesting. So you can see, um, you can't really see that much difference in her pupils right here, but you can see her eyelids kind of retracting on this side. And uh, it's caused by the opposite of a Horner. So the Horner is you're stopping that sympathetic innervation to that side. In this syndrome, you're stimulating that, uh, that sympathetic nerve by irritating it or something. So it's described by this guy, Porfor du Petit, this uh, physician back in like Napoleonic France. And he was mainly seeing it in soldiers who had slash wounds from like a saber to their neck. And so initially they would have this Porfor du Petit, this reverse Horners, and then as the irritation went away and, and everything kind of took its course, it became more of a Horner syndrome on that side. But people can have this kind of reverse Horners transiently as well. Okay, now how about a transient Horners and a little peanut? So, um, <coughs> seven-year-old girl, and she has, uh, she has apparently a Horner syndrome that comes and goes. She's here for RSV infection. Oh yeah, sorry. So um, in this case, she doesn't really have a, if you can see it, I don't know that you can, a lot of anisocoria, but the cases I was reading about, they, they still have a larger people on the affected side. And so it's just like a reverse of Horner's. The pupil's gonna get a little bit bigger, the eyelid's gonna retract a little bit, and then later after the damage has taken its effect, if it's from traumatic damage, then um, you're gonna get a smaller pupil and a little bit of ptosis on that side. Is that because there's more sympathetic front, right? Mm -hmm. So, so your, your constrictors, right, are going to be a little overwhelmed by the dilators, which are, I, I see what you mean, yeah. That's a good question. I wouldn't, and I don't have a good answer for that, but what, from what I've read, it sounds like you can have either or. Um, so in this case, for this lady, I don't really see a lot of anisocoria. Um, but in the other cases they described in this paper and another one, it's, they did have anisocoria with the affected side being a little bit more open. So um, since that sympathetic system is being irritated, um, it's, gonna, it's gonna overwhelm the constrictors a little bit on that same side, and it's going to overwhelm that, um, that, uh, that eyelid and kind of pull it open a little bit as well. Okay, so transient Horner's and a little peanut. So now the seven-year-old girl, she's got a Horner syndrome that comes and goes. She's admitted for an RSV infection, totally unrelated, but mom and dad have numerous photos of her with and without this, and they're not really worried about this. She seems to have had this like all her life, uh, but the team is really terrified about this and, and says, would you please come and just take a look at this patient, see if this is really a Horner syndrome, see if there's something we need to do. So um, again, exam is totally normal, and let's take a look at this. So. This kid, you can't really see the pupils too well, but there is no anisocoria. And this kid right here is already dilated. But what, what would you, how would you describe this? If you see this patient and then you give me a call on the phone, what would you say? And she knows that this is how it changes. What she, 
right? The ptosis goes away when, when they move their jaw. And she, she'll know this, right? She's like, yeah, my mom and dad have noticed when I'm chewing food, it just kind of like comes and goes. And so she knows if she opens her jaw or she moves her, she uses her lateral pterygoids and moves her jaw to the side that it, that it kind of resolves that ptosis. Doesn't just resolve it, but actually causes a little bit of retraction on that affected side. Marcus Gunn, right? So this is the synkinesis between um, the uh, levator and a person's pterygoids or, or other jaw muscles, muscles of mastication. And so it's something that, uh, that this kid was probably born with. It's probably benign. You can kind of stop there. Um, so this Marcus Gunn jaw wink. So remember, not all ptosis is horners. Look at those pupils very carefully. Um, so it brings up a good topic though, which is horners in kids. So a congenital horners is usually going to be benign. Does anyone want to hazard a guess at what's going on with this kid? So he, uh, he has a heterochromia that they describe with congenital horners. And so um, you can see he has this really light colored iris right here but he has some meiosis and some ptosis on this side. Anyone notice anything about his hair? Yes. Straight, up. Straight on this side and curly on this side. So this congenital horners, it's usually benign. Kid, the kid was born with it. They had some damage at birth. Maybe it had to do with how they're you know, delivered, forceps or something like that. And, um, and so because they don't have that the same sympathetic innervation on one side, the thought is that melanin requires that sympathetic nerve pathway to kind of make its way to the appropriate tissue. And so they just stay, you know, when kids are born, they have these blue eyes, they just stay blue eyed on that side. The other thing is it has something to do with how the hair curls. And so they'll sometimes have curly hair on the unaffected side and straight hair on the other. But if you see a congenital horners, um, and in fact, there's, there's a literature about a 47 year old man that was diagnosed with congenital horners. Wasn't noticed until he was 47. He has this uh, heterochromia. He goes in and they image him and they do all this stuff and then they just start looking through these old photos and he just, he had already, you know, he had always had this, just no one seemed to notice. Um, but then what if you see a Horner's in a kid that's like, uh, that's uh, an acquired Horner's in a kid, you know, in their first five years of life? In that case, you should be thinking about like a neuroblastoma and some neck and chest imaging might be required. Another thing to remember with Horners is that a lot of your cases are going to be idiopathic, anywhere from 30 to 70 percent. And if you've rotated through clinic, you guys know that we don't always have a good answer for why someone has a Horner. Sometimes we have a theory, sometimes we just we don't have anything, but we just know it's not one of these sinister diagnoses. Um, one thing that uh, that I remember seeing too, uh, rotating through primaries, was a Horner syndrome, post-surgical Horner syndrome, and and. Uh, Everyone kind of terrified of what happened here, and we didn't touch this kid's head or neck. Like, their head and neck was not positioned in any kind of awkward way, and um, you know that that's not where we we're doing surgery. We're doing like a robotic surgery right down here. I know it's the same side as the Horners, but like we didn't touch that. And the, like, the, I know the sympathetics don't go down here. Like, what could be going on? And uh, then the next question asked was, how, how was the patient positioned? I, I told you their neck was fine. How was their arm positioned? because this kid was like in this position for eight hours. And so you stretch the lower brachial plexus where your sympathetic nerves run through and they probably had a stretch injury of their sympathetics on that side. And um, the Horners actually improved dramatically afterwards in that kid just after a couple months, which kind of corroborated the whole um, uh, stretch injury. And then the other thing here is that uh, cocaine uh, is, the, is the, the agent of choice in pediatric patients. And the reason you don't want to use the apiclonidine is it's also a CNS depressant. Okay, case number five, it wasn't there before. So 37-year-old woman who comes to clinic, uh, she has this uh, right-blown pupil that uh, was noticed by her sister yesterday. I'm sorry, was noticed by her sister today. She knows it was not there yesterday. She takes a lot of time doing her makeup. She did not see any change in the pupils. Her sister's a nurse, tells her you should go into the hospital right away. So she actually came to the emergency department to be seen. And then um, someone 
uh, wheeled over a slit lamp to get a better look at her. So uh, the pupil, so it's uh, three millimeters on the left, five millimeters on the right, and the right pupil is unresponsive to light with this decreased accommodation. Um, and then uh, you just whip out your reflex hammer and you're just checking their reflexes for fun because I know you guys have a lot of time on consults to do that kind of thing. And you see they don't have any deep tendon reflexes. Any thoughts going on here? She's walking into the emergency department. So it's probably not a herniation. 80s people, Good. any other thoughts? Yeah, okay, totally. That can sometimes trip you up, right? Is uh, when you see two things and you're like, I gotta make these two fit. And it's like, well, what if this one has nothing to do with that one? So. <laughs> could be that, right? Because she could be like a really bad diabetic and she just doesn't have any that you can find, right? So, you get her under the slit lamp, you, you blow the dust off the slit lamp in the emergency department, and you sit her down and you put her chin up there and you're looking at it and you see this. And conveniently your slit lamp has these little arrows that point towards this, what's going on? <laughs> right, sectoral palsy. And again, a good, um, a good couple of videos that you guys can see on Novel that Dr. Degree has up there. Any thoughts then? Pharmacologic or 80s? More of an 80s, right? So they tend to have this unreactive, so, so again, some teaching points. Unreactive pupil in a conscious patient, get them under the slit lamp and see if you can find that sectoral palsy, right? Because um, you're thinking either pharmacologic or 80s people, those two should be high on your list. Um, and you can check after one week with a, with a dilute pilocarpine, and I thought I'd just put this in here. Um, if you guys ever wanna try it out, this is kind of the recipe for getting yourself some dilute pilocarpine ready, and this is the criteria for it. If you have like a 0.1% dilute pilocarpine, the affected pupil um, should constrict at least a, more than a half millimeter than the, uh, than the unaffected pupil after you put it in. But it's also important to note that you can actually see supersensitivity to dilute pilocarpine in third nerve palsies. Much rarer, but it's still something to keep in mind. And then uh, people can have bilateral 80s pupils, and that's gonna be more common in someone who has widespread autonomic dysfunction, like someone who also has a diabetic or alcoholic neuropathy. And then there's this midbrain correctopia as well, where, that I talked about earlier, where people can have this kind of oval looking pupil because of rostral midbrain damage or an extrinsic compression lesion. So the midbrain's being compressed, you're thinking, okay, this must be like herniation, but they, it looks like there's some sectoral palsy to that, or maybe they're just oddly shaped. It could be this kind of mid-brain correctopia. And then uh, some important things to remember with tonic pupil. So day one, your big pupil is not gonna be reactive in light or in dark. And um, I'm sorry, it's not gonna be reactive in light or with accommodation, with near. And you will still see the sectoral palsy acutely. One week after that, then it becomes super sensitive to pilocarpine, to dilute pilocarpine. Eight weeks after that, they start to get their uh, light near dissociation, and the pupil will start to redilate after constriction uh, really slowly, hence it gets that term tonic. And then several years later, uh, they can get this little old 80s pupil. So this is from an article of a guy who had uh, a right 80s pupil, and then this is 10 years later, you can see he's looking a little grayer here, and now this people, if anything, looks a little smaller than the other. And uh, notice the eyelid here compared to there. What might this guy be mistaken for? A Horner's, right? So something to keep in mind with, with a Horner's is it could be a little old 80s. And I think just last week we had a patient with a little old 80s in clinic. Okay. Was that a real case? This one here? Uh, like the home thing. Oh, I get this one. Oh, okay. So if there's something glaringly wrong with it, it's as I just pointed out. <laughs> uh, the others were. 
Um, okay, so let's go into the questions. And um, I think I have 10. You want to write down your answers?
our system, guys. Uh, which of the following pharmacologic agents is the safest to use in children? Okay, so the answer is B. You see a patient with the left corners, his exam is otherwise normal, but this happened yesterday after a vehicle accident, small little fender bender on the highway. What's the next best thing to do? The reason you want to get that urgently is they could have a thrombus sitting in there. And it could mean a stroke later on if it's not appropriately managed. Usually though, if they don't see an active thrombus, they'll just put the patient on aspirin and have them follow up. If there is an active thrombus though, they'll sometimes admit that it's not <clears throat> You've seen a 35-year-old woman, she's otherwise healthy, right in large people with sexual palsy for Movements. It was noted yesterday. You get some dilute pyrocarpine, you can still it in both eyes. The right people fails to shrink down. What's your next step? A. So I would go with A. Um, remember, you're, uh, you've got an acute 80s people, is what this looks like, and they haven't developed that super sensitivity to pyrocarpine yet. But if you've got sectoral palsy, she's otherwise healthy. And um, and oftentimes, like AIDS pupils are not imaged. And we oftentimes don't use dilute by the car It's just kind of a clinical diagnosis. So I would feel comfortable not doing anything for now, but bringing her back in maybe in a week and then retesting and just seeing if things change. And then you can also talk to her about here's what you do if you start her <laughs> 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 what percentage of people with corners will never get an answer as to why they have corners? B, B, D. D, 50%. So it's anywhere from like 30 to 70%, but like we just usually get people the ballpark 50%. Okay, you see this 25 year old woman, she's found down in the bathroom at the emergency department shortly after being discharged. She was seen initially for a headache. Right pupils blown, just take her intubator right there. No questions asked. Um, they can't extubate her now, but she's alert, she's following commands. And uh, she got an MRI brain, she got an MRI head, everything's red as normal. And then um, someone calls you and asks you what the next step is here. She does not have any sectoral pulse. Hmm. Sorry. Said D, but not my comfort. Okay, so any other thoughts? A? Yeah, I would do A. Um, this is actually a case they had, and they MRI her three times, and they vessel imaged her with an MRA and then a CTA, and I think they did a conventional angio as well. They were terrified about this person. Um, and then someone started talking to the respiratory therapist. They said, well, I can't excavate her because she's just not giving it that effort. And then you go into her history a little bit more and you find a couple of things. One, she's in this like single person bathroom and she's found down with her pants down around her ankles and the door was unlocked. Like, I don't know about you, but I usually lock the door when I go into a public bathroom. Or a not public bathroom. Um, and then, um, a couple other things come out with a lot of social stressors, psychiatric issues, and then you find out that she works at this uh, urology lab, and uh, they, um, they deal with large quantities of atropine, and you talk to some of her coworkers. And so um, her people took like a week and a half to start to come down. She must have instilled a lot in there, and atropine could take a while to come down. Uh, but eventually it did come down. Like I said, all her imaging and everything was negative. What they eventually did is someone did try some 1% pilocarpine and it failed to constrict the eye, which made them think this is probably not a third, she's probably not herniating. Her extractive movements have stayed normal this entire time. Um, let's, so let's just make sure this is really a third or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so is MRI and MRI, <clears throat> are they both sensitive enough that if she had it, then it would caught it? Yeah, so you can sometimes uh, miss like a small PCOM aneurysm with MRA. Um, and there's a book, um, what's it called? 
common pitfalls in their ophthalmology. But it was written like seven years ago, and they have a case in there where even back then it was extremely <coughs> rare for someone to miss an aneurysm big enough to cause okay. um, to cause a third nerve. So I mean, it could be missed. But um, the resolution of these scans has gotten better and better. And with everything else in there, I would say, let's just try the pilot carping first. Not wrong to do the CTA, but if you try the pilot carping and it does react, you're like, hey, maybe this is a third, then I would get additional energy. But the pilot carping will be a lot cheaper. You know, it also depends on the clinical situation. Like if somebody has, you know, like a droopy lid and some motility deficits, then I would get an angiogram. I wouldn't mess around with the carpet. But in a case where the motility is full and there's no ptosis, mm -hmm. you're kind of like, well, this is weird. All I've got is a big pupil. Yeah. Don't forget, yeah. I'm the carpet. Yeah. And the other thing with her pupil is it was a lot like that uh, that one I showed you, the Jimson weed guy. It's just, and, and to get it that big, right? These third nerves are big, but they're usually not pharmacologic big. So, what was the other thing? But yeah, you weigh all that evidence together and you know. Okay, question six. So you've seen a patient with ptosis and a sicoria, or there's a smaller people in the side of the ptosis. He has raging, stabbing pain on the right side spontaneously for four hours now. He's pacing them up and down. The lights are on in the emergency department. He also has this tearing and injection on the side, but there's no proptosis. His so eye movements are totally normal. We tried a migraine cocktail, didn't work. CT head was negative. What would you guys like to do next? So what do you guys think of this? Cluster. Cluster. So you've already looked at, I mean, the CT head, we often joke about it. It's totally useless. But you have ruled out some big bleed, um, for now, at least. So you could get imaging, but why don't you try treating this first? And um, the thing with oral tryptans, uh, subcutaneous tryptan will actually help cluster, but oral tryptans don't. Um, and then setting this person for an non-urgent referral before you've tried something to get that pain away, kind of sucks. All right, how long does it take for someone in the 80s to become sensitive to the dilute protocol? A week. Three possible etiologies for transient anisocoria? Cluster. Cluster. Migraine. Uh, Pharmacologic exposure. Pharmacologic exposure. Like gypsum. Like gypsum. Um, so you have that tadpole pupil, springing pupil, right? benign uh, madriasis. How does a Horner's pupil react to cocaine? On the third order. And um, uh, this little picture rocks over the rock and roll clown. Here. Um, so you can see how cocaine works. It inhibits the reuptake of norepinephrine. And so a Horner syndrome from any cause, that eye, that affected eye should not dilate much. It might dilate a little bit, but it shouldn't dilate much. The difference between the two should become anything. And then what about to hydroxyamphetamine when it's third order? Any thoughts on that? It does. It does. Definitely. So, this is how hydroxyamphetamine works. It takes the norepinephrine that's available here, and it pushes it out into the synapse. So if my third order neuron is intact, I should have some norepinephrine here that's ready to come out into the synapse and do its business and dilate that eye. However, if that third order is damaged, then I won't have this norepinephrine sitting here. And hydroxyamphetamine, therefore, won't have anything to secrete out into the synapse. And so I shouldn't get the reaction. Um, 
so just a couple of uh, quick points, and that is in my general ophthalmology clinic, so not my neuro clinic, but like my comments of ophthalmology clinic, the most common cause of uh, uh, episodic anisocoria is benign episodic unilateral drugs. It's really, really common. And, um, and these people, the, the story that TR was telling is very accurate. When they come to your clinic, their pupils are normal. And that's part of the differential diagnosis. You examine them, there's no light ear dissociation, there's no motility deficit, there's no ptosis, there's no sphincter palsies, their pupils are equal. But they often come with selfies showing, you know, what they look like during the spell. Their pupils can be really, really big. And it can it usually last hours, and it does not need to be associated with a headache. These people usually have a migraine history, but they don't necessarily have a headache at the time that they have the animal support. And they're usually asymptomatic until somebody says, what's wrong with your eye? Uh, and then uh, the slit lamp is really your friend when you're evaluating somebody with anisocoria. You want to look for sphincter palsies. Because if you see sphincter palsies on a pupil, that's pathic pneumonic or an AIDS pupil. You're pretty much done. You don't have to mess around with the or anything. You've got the diagnosis. You can also look for transillumination deficits. So you can look for posterior synechia. You can look for other signs that the iris has been damaged at some point by trauma. So the slit lamp exam is really a helpful part of your anisocoria evaluation. And if you're ever in a jam, like if you're trying to figure out if somebody has, so the big dangerous things in this lecture are orders and third ball, right? Those are the things you worry about on call. And those are the times when it's like 2 in the morning, you don't have any help. Okay, so acute corner syndrome. Uh, you're not going to have cocaine eye drops, you're not going to have hydroxyamphetamine, you're not going to have abercrombie. So you just, the, the only thing you can really do is look at old photos, make sure, you know, if you can, if they're available, convince yourself it's new. And if it's new, you just have to scan from stem to stern, right, from the whole sympathetic pathway, head, neck, and chest. In a third nerve palsy, um, you know, like DR said, if you have a, a unilateral big pupil, an isolated big pupil, no motility deficits, no ptosis, in an awake, responsive, walking, talking patient, you can pretty much cross third nerve palsy off your list. And if you're really worried, you know, pilocarpine is, you can usually get a hold of some pilocarpine. Right? That will help differentiate it from like pharmacologic or benign episodic hydriasis or some other some other more benign cause. Um, if you have a patient with uh, a motility deficit or a little bit of like that's third nerve palsy until proven otherwise. And then like third nerve palsy is like an hour long lecture of like how to take care of that. But in an emergency situation, like you're, you are concerned about an aneurysm, but like the more common things are gonna be like diabetes. And so trying to differentiate a diabetic third from a aneurysmal third, that's kind of a subject of Dr. Degree's lecture later on the lecture series. Um, but pilocarpine can really be helpful in that situation because if, if the pupil doesn't react to 1% pilocarpine, you know you're dealing with something like pharmacologic. A third nerve palsy will constrict to pilocarpine. So that helps, that, that's a quick way to help yourself out. Have a nice week.